a common criteria certification and especially how it relates to open source projects. Uh, so this is the short agenda. First, uh, like common criteria, what it is and why you uh, use it. And then how it uh, relates to open source, how it uh, works together with open source and how can an open source project be common, cr common criteria certified and how does the certification uh, affect the project. And you can interrupt with questions at any time, just feel free. So, uh, uh, first, uh, how many of you think you have uh, some hunch of what common criteria is all about? Uh, everyone, almost. Fantastic. Let's see uh, if it's uh, really like that. So, what is common criteria? Well, it's short for common criteria for information technology security evaluation. And it's a standard for uh, computer software certification defined by ISO, etc. blah, blah, blah. blah. And uh, what does it uh, provide? It provides assurance that the specification, implementation, and evaluation processes uh, of certified products are done according to a rigorous and standard way. And there are certain ways why you want to have this, which we will uh, come back more to later. So who uses common criteria and why? Well, there are three kind of uh, user categories which are interested by common criteria. Uh, one is, of course, uh, computer system compute, uh, consumers, the actual uh, customers of a product, and they want to specify their functional and security requirements and insurance requirements. Then there are the vendors, of course, who can advertise that their products are certified to get into some uh, deals, etc., and sell better. And then, uh, finally, there are testing laboratories to make a hefty amount of income by actually testing and evaluating different products. So those are the kind of three uh, categories that are interested in computer uh, certification. So why on earth would you want to go through a common criteria certification? Well, the basically the only reason why you want to do it as a developer or a vendor is that uh, user groups like banks, governments, and major corporations sometimes require certified software in order for you to install them in their system or in order for them to use it. And of course, open source vendors like ourselves have the same requirements as proprietary vendors. So either you're in or out if you want to uh, make business or uh, if someone wants to use your software. It's uh, very binary. Uh, so one thing that is uh, kind of I put forward here uh, immediately is that common criteria is very static certification. We'll get back to that uh, more later. So we have one certified version, and uh, that means that no other versions are certified. So, so now we have established that yes, if uh, you have some uh, users who actually require common criteria certification, then you as a developer, you want to do it. So. How does it work? And what do you do? Uh, so there are four, uh, what's it called? Uh, four different actors in the common criteria certification. One is the sponsor, who actually pays for it. Uh, one is the developer, who implements the software. And the third is the lab, who does the evaluation. And the final one is the certification body, who uh, well, actually issues the certificate. That means they signed a nice paper that says that this software is common criteria certified. So those are the four actors in a certification. And what does the certification do? Well, it tests, tests uh, a few things. Primarily, it has documentation. Um, Security. Primarily, exactly. Uh, the common criteria evaluation test that the documentation of security functions is complete, that you don't uh, you know, leave some stuff out or uh, make a half-assed job of documenting your things. And secondly, it also tests the implementation that the security functions actually do what you claim that they do, which is uh, probably you know, the most interesting thing. And they also test 
thinks about the development environment and development process. So they test that the development environment is uh, fairly secure and that you have uh, somewhat secure development processes. So it's not uh, you know, trivial for someone to uh, break into your system and plant uh, uh, malware into the software, even you know, future versions, because nobody wants that. So that's uh, the basic things that the Comercatier certification tests. And now, to spin your heads, uh, we will say that Comercateria, this is uh, Mike's words, it's uh, just a very large amount of three level acronyms. So this is the first thing when you do a Comercateria certification, you have to figure out what the hell does all this mean. And, uh, you know, there are all these three level acronyms and they reference to each other and uh, it's just very hard to remember what what the hell is a TSF or IMP, etc. And when you go through the evaluation, you get a message from the lab that says, well, you failed to uh, document AARC underscore FOC1 in the F2P. And you say, what the hell does that do to me? So you have to Google it to see, okay, what's the F2P? Ah, that was that. Do you know the meaning of all these which you have written? Uh, <laughs> Almost. <laughs> like TSFI? Yes. Is target security function. No, toe security function interface. Exactly. And, uh, it's kind of recursive uh, acronyms as well. Because toe is another acronym. Uh, so this is a toe security function interface. So this acronyms in acronyms. Part of the evaluation security. So it, the first thing is it takes uh, when you start with certification, it takes some time for actually to get to learn all the, all the terms, at least to a level where you can uh, do something about it. So that's like the first six months of the evaluation period. Well, for the not just terms, right? There are also like specific concepts you have to get around your head, right? Yeah. And it's not terms; it's an Exactly. Well, if you learn what the TSFI means, you actually will, it doesn't say much. You also have to understand what concept yeah, is and how it links together. EMS levels, I guess. Yeah, the evaluation assurance level. So we will uh, go through this a little bit more to uh, get your head around it. So when you start with the common criteria certification, you have a few documents to start with. Uh, the first one, as of course, are the common criteria standard. They are actually freely downloadable, and that's uh, many other ISO standards. But that's, you know, like four, five documents, 200 pages each. So uh, that, that defines uh, all the predefined uh, requirements, because there are a lot of predefined requirements uh, which you can, you can choose from. So I would say that's primarily targeted at the evaluators. The evaluating lab is the only one who actually can read and understand the standard documents. Secondly, you have a protection profile, if you're lucky that is, uh, which we were. And that is predefined requirements for a certain type of software, for example, firewalls, smart cards, certification authorities. And those are documents that are created by uh, user groups or governments. For example, NIST, Department of Defense, or EU, creates these predefined security requirements, which just says that a certification authority must be able to issue certificates. Uh, must be able to manage replication information. And uh, the same with smart cards, you know, it has to create digital signatures, etc. So with the basis of only this, you start a certification process. And then you come, you have to start to create a lot of things. Uh, so this is what do we have to create as the uh, developer. Uh, well, as you see, this is only page one of the list of what we have to create. Uh, first, you have to create a security target. The security target describes all the security functions that your software has and the threats that these security functions are meant to counter. I mean, there's no point in having a uh, security function if it doesn't correspond to some threat that you want to uh, counter. So, luckily, if you have a protection profile, this is actually mostly a copy of the protection profile. So, this one, you're lucky. Uh, then comes the stuff that you have to create from scratch. First we have a functional specification. 
which describes all the uh, security functions in detail. I will show you examples of it. Uh, secondly, we have a design specification which uh, describes uh, modules and the uh, interactions between different modules in your software. Uh, and then we also have implementation representation. Here we are also lucky because this implementation representation is basically a list of all the files in your software. And uh, they are kind of nice. We can use a tool like Doxygen to just how to generate this. So that's uh, probably the easiest of them all to create. Uh, page two in the long list of documents that you have to create uh, is something called the preparative procedures. That's how to configure the system in order to be uh, a certified installation. Yeah. Uh, then we have operational user guidance, how to use the system. Uh, we have a test plan, which uh, where you have to document uh, tests and actually test protocols for all the security functions in your system, so you can prove that you have tested everything. Uh, we have a security architecture that uh, defines well, how uh, your software implements security in a kind of architecture way. Uh, something called lifecycle support, which is uh, probably the document that affects your open source project the most. Uh, so we'll talk uh, a lot about this. Uh, that defines the processes for development and release, and how you, for example, uh, accept uh, flaws, uh, issue reports from users if the user finds a security problem, how you receive it, and, and that. And also a configuration list, lists of all files and external dependencies if you use uh, other uh, libraries like Apache libraries, etc. You have to document these as well. So that was uh, only two pages of different documents that you have to create during the evaluation period. So I will show you a little bit more in detail about uh, what these documents are. And describe some of these three level acronyms. First, then the security target, as we mentioned. Uh, the security target defines the TOE, uh, which is the target evaluation, your software. And it describes the TSF, which is the TOE, security functions, well, the security functions that your uh, software implements. Uh, one of the most important things that the security target defines is actually the, uh, well, the, the boundaries of your target of evaluation. It defines what is inside and what is outside of the uh, evaluation. That means what the lab will actually look at. So this is, uh, in our case, in the CC Core project, we determined that the actual software, the Java files that we developed, and the configuration of those, the, that is what is inside the target of evaluation, what is actually evaluated. Then outside, we leave like hardware security modules, database, and applications to use this API. That is uh, out of the scope of the evaluation. That means that the lab will not, if we use MySQL or Postgres, it means that the lab will not bother about the security, or mostly not about the security of MySQL or Postgres itself. So they will not you know, look into the security features of, of the database. Uh, so it can be how insecure as you want, basically. Uh, what do you have to take care of is actually the connections to this. So then the, the, the lab focuses on this gray part. That's very important to define what is inside and outside of the scope. Did that require any negotiation or your, they don't say that you, we would like to have a, the whole package evaluated or you define it or? No, it requires a little bit of negotiation. Uh, for example, like the DB, you have to say, well, can we say that the database is completely outside? Uh, of, the tor of the scope? Well, yes, you can, but actually the data that is stored in the database, that's more or less part of the application. So even if the database is outside uh, of the scope, the data itself in the database must be integrity protected. So even if the database itself is in insecure, uh, then the data itself is secure that you put into it. So, and then you have to 
has to have this that okay to you know don't care about anything about what's stored there. No, they would say no. You have to have some integrity protection, etc. So you can negotiate it a little bit. You can probably negotiate to have configuration outside, or inside, etc. So you want to try to make it as easy as possible for you, but still uh, you know provide uh, fulfilling the requirements and having a decently secure product. The next function specification, there you have to, well, you're not supposed to be able to read all this because it's, I can't even read it myself. Uh, but it's, uh, you have to actually define all the modules in your software and the interactions between them. So you have put all your modules here and then you have to figure out which module calls what, etc. So it can get uh, pretty complicated. And that's only you know, the first step of the function specification. Uh, the second step is that you have to get into more detail. You have to uh, define all the you have modules and you have uh, uh, what are they called? Functions and uh, well, there are three things and they are named differently in different documents. So I will get uh, back to that uh, also slightly later. Uh, so you have to define a very uh, kind of detail. You have, for instance, certificate and profile management, typical component of a CA, and there you have to define that you have certificate profiles, so you have uh, CRL profiles, and you have uh, CRL issuance, such as and certificate issuance. And you also have to define all the individual functions. So it gets fairly hairy with details. So this is just one example of a uh, one thing that is required in the protection profile that we use is a backup and restore. And then you have to describe very much in detail this is the restore function. So you have to say what's the purpose of the restore function? Well, to restore a backup, of course. How do you use it? Uh, what inputs do you have? Well, the previous made backup is the input to restore, of course. Uh, what actions does the uh, restore function do? And uh, what's the output? Well, it's a restore TOE. And what error messages, what security event, the log events uh, happens, etc. And uh, finally, you also have to define uh, in the uh, security target what is called the SFR, security function requirements. So you have to uh, link this function to uh, what uh, security requirements does it fulfill. So then everything can be backtraced to back and forth to see that, well, we have these requirements and that requirement is uh, implemented by the restore function and the restore function implements uh, these requirements. And finally, you also have to say which interfaces this is available uh, from. And this has uh, some... Uh, uh, later on, uh, when you actually test stuff, if you have a lot of interfaces, you can have like if this is one an interface, you can also have a web interface, a web service interface, then you have to make tests for all these interfaces that you define that the function is available to. Uh, we have design specification later on, which uh, in some way describes the same things but in a different way. So you have still the backup and recovery, and you describe, well, what does backup and recovery do again? And then you have to say which interactions it has with other modules. So, well, to make a backup, we have access control to see that you uh, are authorized to make a backup. Uh, we have key management for encryption and signature keys for the backup. And finally, there's, it has interaction with a security audit module to actually make to log that we did perform a backup you have to describe all these interconnections in detail. And the most confusing thing, one of the most confusing, most confusing things, uh, I think, is uh, that you have, uh, you need complete mappings between all these documents. So if you describe something in the function specification, corresponding things has to be described in the design specification, and it has to match something in the implementation as well. So if some, something is missing, you describe something here, and you don't have the same thing there, the lab will complain, etc. Or if you describe something there and you don't have a 
something implementing it, of course they will complain. And to make it more uh, confusing, they actually call things differently in different documents. So in the function specification, you have something called a functional module, but in the design specification, it's called a subsystem. And in the implementation, well, we use Java, so it corresponds to a Java package. Uh, in the function specification, you have an interface, but in the design specification, it's called a module. But in the function specification, this one was called a module. So you get a bit confused uh, when you work with this and you start, well, a module, that was a module. No, it's not a module. That was an interface. That's a module. And now that's an interface over there. So uh, that's uh, a cause of a lot of headache. So before I started with common criteria, I surely had a lot of prejudice about common criteria, and I'm sure uh, many of you have a lot of prejudices <laughs> about common criteria, especially if you haven't actually gone through one yourself. So how many have gone through one yourself? That's still going that's through. Yeah, that's uh, the best crowd so far, I think. Well, some prejudices. Well, it's expensive, it's a waste of time, uh, it's just paperwork, it doesn't you know, do any technical stuff. Uh, certified products are only old versions, you can easily get that uh, feeling. And uh, why should certified product products actually be better? Uh, but there are some that's some prejudices that some of them I had, and uh, some of them I still have, and some <laughs> of them I, I have actually converted into other prejudices. <laughs> uh, so, the truth, well, my truth about common criteria, it does take a, lot of, take a lot of time. So that's the prejudice was certainly true, and it does cost a very a hell of a lot of money. But uh, it's not only paper, it's really technical. Uh, evaluation uh, depends, of course, a little bit on which evaluation level you're going to. But the one we did, four plus, is uh, quite technical. It's true that uh, certified versions are old. Uh, we we'll get back to a little bit. So you know, I mean, you never have the latest version is never the one that is the common criteria certified version. Uh, it does provide actually product improvements if you do it uh, kind of properly. And it uh, will improve security in your product during evaluation, uh, unless you had an extremely you know, good process even uh, already before, which uh, I would say is rare. One of the things I was striking is that common criteria thinks of itself as a methodology you should apply before even starting to write your product. But almost everybody uses it after the facts, uh, as you, everything has been designed, everything, so you're retro-documenting and adding mm -hmm. and really rounding the corners that you... Well, I, I, think, I think that's a question at the end, but it's an open story if you apply it often after the fact. In all the industries, it's applied to a yeah, design. All, no, all the industries usually... Yeah, business comes first, yeah. process comes later, I usually. I well. <laughs> that's, that's the truth. I can think of a few industry products where, where this was done from inception. And in those cases, the cost is almost impactful. The extra cost is almost impactful. So one of the questions is whether in the open source world, something like that can be done as well. But well, if you're thinking about the smart and industry, the first versions, they were doing it after the fact. Well, and, sure, and, and after the I'm not thinking of like satellite control systems. That's, uh, that's the second generation of uh, evaluated products. Uh, I'm thinking about CAs and uh, I think that's about signature. The, that's done after the fact. Yeah, yeah, well, that's a test on the head, but DPI, CAs. Well, I think uh, probably either case, even if you do it before, well, if you I mean, do it with inception, your development of the first version will be a hell of a lot more expensive than if you didn't do it before. So it still uh, costs a lot of money and takes a lot of time. Your development is slower from start, etc. Uh, so, but of course, Other common prejudices, but from a user perspective, uh, that means you know the governments or that actually requires this, is that such a uh, certification should guarantee secure software. Well, it does not, of course. 
uh, says certification is not worth anything can also be a prejudice. Well, it is. So probably somewhere in between here. It's worth something, but it definitely doesn't guarantee uh, that's secure software. Um, that's because the CC actually uh, assures with a certain level of assurance, which is this EAL level, that the product works as documented that it shall work. And the keyword here is documented. So if you document that your uh, uh, product does, doesn't do something, or if you don't document that it uh, does something, well, it doesn't care. The evaluation doesn't care what your software doesn't do. It only cares what you say it does. So uh, that's why protection profiles uh, and security targets are uh, important, because they are you know, the predefined security requirements. And the key with that is uh, that actually these protection profiles and security targets, that's, uh, I would say, one issue with common criteria, that uh, in this standard it's supposed that actually the user should be able to read a protection profile for a security target and make some kind of judgment. Is is this product evaluated uh, to what I want, or have they just evaluated you know, the functions that I'm not interested in? But of course, uh, these documents are way too complex for any normal uh, user, even if it's a government, I would say, to read today. So in practice, it's not possible. They just you know, check, oh, it's EAL for class, so it must be good. Uh, and from that also follows that different vendors of different products, like HSMs, they can claim that, well, our product has certified <coughs> all of this, but our competitors' products only certified a small part, because you know, everyone just looks at this, and uh, it's too hard to re actually read and understand what it says in the security target. For the developer. It's very hard and cumbersome to keep uh, track of all the details and mappings in these documents. Uh, so, and actually, I mean, this long list of documents, you only, as a developer, you would definitely only do that if you get paid for it. Uh, no one would ever dream about doing this otherwise. So, that's why, most commonly, I would say, these documents are at least to a large part written by consultants, because uh, it's too uh, boring, cumbersome, difficult actually to get it right. Uh, the certification can both uh, prevent some refactorings. If you have something certified, you don't want to change it a lot. But on the other hand, if you're uh, doing certification and uh, you think, well, we should do this right, then it actually will really encourage uh, refactoring uh, to make it so you have when so you get the right certified version. Could you, could you imagine in, in your product doing very significant effect on rewriting of parts of the code as to generate a much larger part of the documentation or generate in such a way that it actually can do it to be usable and to light up the things like that? Uh, can you repeat? So could you imagine that in, in taking your core and try to rewrite it or refactor it yep. in such a way that a very large part of the documentation either gets generated from it or becomes completely static effectively? So you try not to write it. So you basically try to tune the code to this process as much as possible. Uh, that's possible to some extent, I would say. But... Uh, uh, you can't really generate these documents from the code, unfortunately, I would say. Can I interrupt? Yeah. Uh, I think for this project, in a way, we have tried to do so, in the sense that we did the project first called Common Criteria, which is an API for, for our CA and then uh, some other uh, products as well. And it turns out that even in creating Creating an API, I think everyone would agree with me, is very, very difficult. But then, if you are successful, I think you get where, where you want to be. But I think being successful in this is very difficult. So I think it's difficult. The reason I ask that in, in some non-internet industries, um, this is recognized as a big problem. And very often you see the, the software models which have to be certified be written in very awkward very primitive ways. 
which effectively means that, that this whole process becomes organizationally and then for the developer very, very simple and cheap. So we have a very non-error program effectively and has very little maintenance. So one of the things I've been wondering about also watching all the SSL struggle is whether around some of the security products the core of open source, we need to take a step back, simplify them massively, move the APIs massively in so that some of this can be done in a much more static way. Just the same way that, for example, the Apache Software Foundation initially, we had to struggle with how you dealt with the liability issues around the code contribution and to bring it back to these, these um, computers agreements and, and CCAs and CLAs and all that sort of legal documents. That was a very similar yeah. process. Actually, it's uh, kind of uh, what we did. So I will actually show some uh, architecture of that just in like two slides. So uh, we'll uh, get back to that definitely. Um, well, just finally, that uh, during certification, it's uh, as for a developer perspective, it's not just you know something that you have to overcome. You actually do get uh, from the certification lab very good input and testing. The certification lab really are there to help you. They are not interested in stopping you from getting certification. They are, of course, interested in your product getting certified. Well, they pay for it, and they're usually nice guys, so they will help you to you know, interpret the requirements in a good way for you, etc., and actually test your product very nicely. So, how much does it cost? Is a common question. Well, for us, it uh, took like two years, where we had at least three to four people uh, full time during one of the year, full year, and just the lab. Testing lab costs more than 50,000 euro, so it's a very expensive process. So we spent at least you know a couple of hundred thousand euro uh, doing this evaluation. So it's not for the weak hearted, I would say. So to be more very specific for open source, uh, if open source kind of discriminated by common criteria because it's so uh, kind of tuned for other uh, proprietary software. Both yes and no. Uh, the same requirements are for open source and proprietary software. Concretia doesn't care if your uh, source code is open or closed. It's not secured by obscurity in any way. Uh, there's no requirement that you can't fulfill with open source software. Uh, on the other hand, yes. And because it requires strict control over repository and committers. Uh, so that's not definitely not the perfect match for a community-driven project. Uh, where you don't know everyone, there's no you know single entity that knows all committers, and uh, where you have resource for the repository, etc. Uh, the lifecycle requirements uh, requires very tight uh, control over how you handle issues, etc. So it kind of enforces a slightly centralized uh, development model, and of course it's very high cost. So it requires actually some company which has enough. Uh, money to be able to pay for uh, certification. And all this, I would say, particularly high cost, leads to that there's uh, virtually uh, very few publicly downloadable uh, common criteria certified open source, uh, uh, open source uh, software. And um, if you would use like Git or something, where you have uh, uh, where the like make the boom patches from, from others. Uh, how would that work with the with control? Would the people be pulled from that would have to be like uh, signed agreements and so on? Or, or yeah, I guess the uh, uh, the entity who actually assembles the final software, which holds the official certified version, has to have control of you know, what it pulls and from where. So, this, uh, you know, there's someone who pulls into the kind of official uh, release version, and so you have to have control over uh, those people. Which so other like the Apache Open Source Foundation have exactly the same problems like the third. So we have to complete exactly this problem, and that is basically um, why the, why there are all sorts of legal documents around the Apache Kids or SKS networks, <coughs> which basically make the foundation legal having sufficient oversight over the code base to know that when a, a, something ships from that repository and release build that is the organizational oversight and building that version of that capital that's the 
There's no requirement, there's no uh, technical requirements against uh, open source, but there are prejudices in all the human parts uh, of the process. And so the lab is usually not, not a problem, but it doesn't know much about open source software. And uh, sometimes the evaluator uh, is a bit prejudiced again. So, yeah, so, that can be. so there, there is no technical, but you have to still do some kind of evangelization, evangelization uh, of the different human parts of yeah, the Yeah, you have to select the lab uh, carefully then, of course. We, you know, had, uh, how do you say, uh, procurement for the certification where we had three different labs put in their offers and we choose a French lab which uh, had worked with open source before so they know what it is and uh, not prejudice. You seem to know, the, can you name some other open source things that are common criteria? Yeah. I'll uh, in two slides. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> so the other thing that is uh, kind of non-open open source about common criteria is that uh, common criteria processes I would say uh, like an extreme waterfall process. You document first and you implement later, and you have to have everything super documented. That's not kind of uh, so agile as most common uh, most open source projects work today. So you can kind of see that the uh, communicatory process was invented, you know, some years ago, I would say. So CC communicatory definitely not created, you know, with fast development and flexibility in mind. It's uh, rather way the other way around. It's very static, extremely static. Once you have a certified version with an in, in a specific environment, which means a specific version of operating system, a specific version of application server, hardware security module with a specific firmware version, that is the certified version. Yeah, that's not a comment of <coughs> common criteria, but just because you have to do the evaluation and you have to do the testing on all those platforms, so you usually limit yourself to one platform. Yeah, yeah two in our case, but uh, I think that that's also, you know, you have the static one, uh, but of course you have, uh, you know, security patch for all operating system, even for hardware security modules. But then when you apply the security patch to the operating system, that's no longer the certified version. But uh, uh, that's some uh, other things, how it's supposed to be used or not. Uh, well, you can do some things to remedy this. There's something called impact assessment. If you do you know, fix a patch, you make an impact assessment to say, well, this has, doesn't affect any of the security functions. And then your, the users are supposed to read this and say, well, of course, it's better to use this new uncertified version than the old certified because they're actually certified version as security bugs, this newer version doesn't. Uh, and of course you can do recertification which is yet a new you know, process but uh, still if you have all the documents kind of in shape and then of course that's a lot cheaper at least. This leads to that there are very few open source products which are certified only from larger companies. Red Hat, Enterprise Line, Linux, uh, JBoss, uh, of course, the enterprise version is uh, certified. IBM surely has uh, certified versions. I put Frankie there. We're not a large company, but I think it looks funny. <laughs> uh, and of course, there are even fewer that are publicly available. You know, even Red Hat has certified that, but you know, Red Hat Enterprise Linux is not publicly downloadable, although it's open source. And unfortunately, it's going to be the same with uh, our software. It's just uh, too expensive. So uh, that's uh, also one, that's probably the biggest thing that is kind of against open source in common criteria. It's so expensive. Uh, but on the other hand, I mean, there are probably lots of proprietary pr products that are built on uh, open source which are certified. If you get uh, like a certified product from IBM, uh, where it, which is not open source, I uh, bet you it, it's, it's based on Apache, for instance. So in that way, Apache is certainly certified, but you can't, uh, you know, go to Apache.org and get the certified uh, HTTP server. So uh, this is uh, what we did, which uh, kind of relates back to uh, Dirk's questions before. Uh, we kind of did things actually uh, in a shifted way a little bit. First, we had this EGBCA product, and what we did is we took the uh, security functions uh, from the 
uh, Java code, and we broke it out into a separate new, completely new uh, library, the Java uh, Enterprise Component Library, and refactored to fit uh, you know, good, as good as we could make it, and uh, with software and the modules which kind of reflects uh, and security requirements, etc. And then we certified first this component library. And then uh, the second step is that we took this newly certified component library and we refactored it into EDBCA again uh, to make EDBCA certified. Uh. So first we certified the component library and then we put it into EDBCA and we certified EDBCA. Uh, that is, well, they call it a composite evaluation where you have actually one certified book. Uh, something certified inside another product that makes it a little easier uh, to certify this product because it also already has the, the core certified. Uh, so in that way we actually tune uh, this one to uh, uh, hopefully be you know, a little bit more static than this whole software uh, so that the certification parts or the certified parts would change less and be easier to recertify etc. Uh, that's the whole point. And has this improved things, or has this made things our architecture easier? Uh, improved, definitely. And is this an endpoint, or do you see this going even further, better? Uh, it always goes further, better. Uh, definitely. <coughs> so there are a lot of things that we want to improve already, but uh, once you change something, it's not certified anymore. But that's uh, uh, something else. Uh, there's some more, uh, what we did, uh, EL4 Plus, uh, we had a, luckily, there's a protection profile for certificate authorities, so we uh, could use that, it's called a CIMC. Uh, there's a Comacatera version, uh, where we actually, this protection profile was actually written by NIST some years ago, and it was written for an older version of Comacatera, version 2.1. When you certify something today, it's Comacatera version 3.1, so you have to change some things. Uh, to adapt it to the new Comacatera version. Uh, so that's also, even the protection profiles are a bit, you know, too static. It's uh, valid for like two years, and unless NIST, feel, NIST feels like they want to uh, spend a lot of time and money to update the protection profile, it's, uh, you have to do it yourself. Uh, what is different in open source compared to proprietary software? Uh, one thing is that we have a public repository, code repository. Uh, in the proprietary software companies, you should have strict control over development machines. They have then know where from all developers are, and who develops. Uh, they have some legal control <laughs> over developers, because they are employed by the company. Uh, so, what can we do as an open source project? Well, to have kind of claim to have control over development machines. Uh, we have a user responsibility policy that all committers must sign. It's nothing special, it just says basically that you, yes, I have some uh, you know, malware protection, some firewall, etc. So to, uh, where, so the committer has to say that yes, I have some best effort control that my machine is not infected by malware, basically, stuff like that. Uh, where development is done from, actually that doesn't matter, as long as you have some authentication uh, and encryption. So HTTPS and authentication is good, you can see it wherever in the, in, uh, the world you want to implement. Uh, the same is with some this legal control over who develops, that's this, uh, you have to have some co contract or uh, this user responsibility policy. So that what affects uh, our product, project the most is this ALC, life cycle, uh, the life cycle in the communicator requirements. It actually requires that you have controlled access to the source code repository, which means both logically and physically. And we previously had our uh, repository on SourceForge, no more, because there's no way the certification lab can go to SourceForge and you know, evaluate their uh, hosting facility. So we have to move to our own hosting. 
so the lab could actually come and visit our server room to see that, well, there are badges with codes and uh, multi tracks and things like that, fire protection. Uh, we also need a lot of uh, processes for issue management, code review, testing, release management, not the least, uh, because it has to be uh, release management is very important because the certified release has to be kind of authentic, authenticated for the person who uses a release must be able to authenticate that it's a certified release. And so what we had to do, I uh, told you about this user responsibility policy. All staff and uh, external committer had to change, had to uh, sign a user responsibility pro uh, pro policy. And uh, we have to have access lists who has access to uh, our repository, both you know logically and physically. Uh, for external committers, we use the same user responsibility policy, and we have a review process, uh, code review. Uh, otherwise, we weren't affected too much, actually, because we had uh, fairly uh, good processes already, thanks to Tom there. Uh, we had Jira, Creation Management, DCI code, the inspection, Hudson, you know, continuous integration, etc. So uh, we didn't have to change our processes a lot. Uh, the most thing we had to change the repository and introduce these access lists. Uh, so there's more administration, which takes more time. And we have to do a little more uh, QA than before for each issue, which means that there's a uh, slightly slower development than before. You know, you can't be as fast as when you're not certified, I would say. On the other hand, you get a little better quality assurance per issue. So actually, you uh, do get slightly better, I would say. Uh, from our, for our sake, our software is uh, uh, better, and better structured, uh, Hopefully, slightly more secure, uh, slightly better tested. Uh, so the code has definitely gained from our certification, but it has taken a lot of time and cost a lot of money, which uh, forced us to change uh, some things, which maybe we were that we definitely would not have changed otherwise. That's it. Do you have like some specific things in the code base you can point out that were the result of or feedback from the lab or something like that? Uh, yes. Uh, we thought that we did not have any SQL injection vulnerabilities because we had <laughs> definitely <laughs> checked that many times. But they found some actually, but that's what on the API level. So I don't think we didn't actually have it from you know, the web interface, but we had it in the API level. So now we even on the API level, it uh, doesn't have any, uh, well, not any that we know mm -hmm. for the lab. Uh, that's one thing. But I mean, like additions in components or, uh, or uh, changes? <laughs> well, in there are some uh, funny components, uh, especially in the API which we put in the CC core part, we had to put uh, uh, yeah, in this API here we have like a function for backup and recovery because you have to have, to have that and we don't, this doesn't have a call and interface or anything. So we have a Java you know, API components for backup and recovery which kind of sucks. So, but we had to, we must have those functions. So we had to, Mike had to implement those in uh, some functions just to be able to fulfill all requirements and pass all the tests. But down here, we, you know, we won't use those. So that's kind of a sham functions just to pass this uh, component library through certification. But we don't use them down here. Here we instead use command and interface uh, to do basically the same. So there are uh, some We've added stuff some stuff for audit logs as well and some other things, uh, which I find very, very useful. But we probably would have done anyway. Yeah, that's uh, probably, that's what kind of the, some sham uh, file functions which we had to introduce. The other, probably the best thing, as Tom said, is that the security audit uh, now is uh, awesome. And it's well specified exactly what the security audit uh, There's an uh, integrity protected uh, security audit uh, with digital signature or HMAC. And it's uh, you know, all 
a whole code has gone through very meticulously to ensure that the security audit is exactly as specified in exactly as all requirements, etc. So that's uh, that has been a, a lot better than before. So, so a lot of this you go through to certify and that's really so like to, to, to kind of like pass blame to say that, oh, well, it wasn't my fault to certify sort of thing, right? <laughs> so what you sometimes see is that uh, functions end up sort of like um, not being made stronger, but our security wires, the wires made stronger, but sort of like make it much easier to sort of like figure out who was to blame afterwards, even if it increases the risk of that function going wrong. Um, and it's very common, especially like in chip cards and things like that, where, where whole sort of engineering are made that way. Um, did you find you had to do the same thing in here as well, or, or was that relatively rare, or, or not at all? Uh, I would say not. Uh, actually, so it's uh, the only kind of sound engineering. Uh, so you didn't end up sort of like a certain function that you had to add, which yeah, basically exposed all the issues. No. Which, which uh, HSMs did you target? Uh, SafeNet, Luna, and uh, Utomato. And yeah, we certified on two platforms. Uh, one was uh, uh, Revit Enterprise, JBoss, and uh, PostgreSQL with SafeNet, Luna, HSM. The other one, don't know, X around Windows Server. <laughs> 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 MySQL, though. No. And uh, you to make a uh, crypto server okay. and Glassfish application server. And from the Sesacore website, at least there should be uh, like this is EGBCA, EGBCA, right? Centric talk. But uh, uh, what are the other applications to be built around the the core? Yeah. So we have uh, this project was actually a cooperation then. Um, in order to get 50% funding from the EU, which we got for this, uh, we had uh, just us, a Norwegian company, a Portuguese company, and a Turkish company. So we have built this around it. The Portuguese has a uh, timestamp server built on top of it, and uh, the others uh, have a timestamp. Okay. So, so uh, the question is that the CA profiles this will be out in a year and a half, two years from now. Is there any chance that like through one of the EU projects or through the, uh, the folks in the EU folks in Greece that can be rekindled? With a protection profile? Yeah. Uh, not the dive part of probably not. It's not a dive no. So but then uh, I mean the same the, the protection profile is actually outdated and not, not valid anymore, but that's also a negotiation between the lab and the certification authority, uh, the certification body, that they, you know, agree that, well, if we do these changes to this old protection profile, we can still claim compliance. So, where did you get to this certification body did you use? Uh, ANSSI in France, and the lab was called OPILA, the French certification uh, evaluation lab. Quite uh, good in my experience. So we're uh, we're at, we're very happy with uh, that part at least. That we have the nice people to work with. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.